Welcome to another virtual Fost North event. Big thanks to our sponsors and partners. So welcome back. Uh, this will be the last talk of the day, and this is actually pre-recorded. Uh, but Alex and George will be with us uh, during the Q&A. So please enjoy uh, the talk about Tor and uh, Anonymity Loves Diversity. Hello, and welcome to a talk about Tor. This time we are going to talk about Anonymity Loves Diversity and why this is a thing which is mattering for Tor. Um, we have prepared um, talking about different parts of Tor and uh, how diversity plays a role in them. But before we are going to do so, we'll start with a short introduction about ourselves and um, about what, what this Tor thing is for those of you who haven't heard of it before. I'm Georg. I've been volunteering for Tor since 2010 and became what is called a core Tor developer in 2013. I was mainly working on uh, Tor browser and the Tor button and uh, reproducible builds efforts. Eventually, I started leading the Tor browser team in 2016 and recently moved on to uh, the so called network health work. My name is Alex. I'm also a core developer with the Tor project. I've only been around since 2017, where I started working full-time on Tor. I'm heading up Tor's network team, which is a team responsible for the Tor software, not the browser, but the little program that is responsible for talking with the network. I've been a free software developer since 2006. I've maintained um, a variety of small utilities. I think the most known one is the ERC IRC client. Prior to Tor, I was working with various distributed systems written in primarily the Erlang programming language. And I've also done WebKit-based browsers for the Qt WebKit team at Nokia, which was the team responsible for also delivering the web browser for the N9 handsets, which was the um, Amigo phone that Nokia developed a couple of years ago. In my spare time, I'm doing the annual Bornhack Hacker Festival in Denmark. So if you're looking for a good Hacker Festival, once we're done with this pandemic, you should definitely check out bornhack.dk for more information about that. The first thing we're going to look at is what is Tor? Tor is an online anonymity and censorship circumvention tool set. We develop a browser which bundles a number of different smaller utilities, such as the actual Tor software, which is the software that speaks with the, with the network. Everything we do is free software. It's available for people to look at, inspect, figure out how it works, help solve bugs, all these kind of things. We generally develop it as a free software project. One of the big things we're going to talk about in this presentation is the Tor network. It's an open network, meaning that everybody who wants to participate can participate in it. Additionally, Tor is also a pretty big community of researchers, developers, users, and also relay operators. The relay operators are the human beings or organizations that are running these different uh, nodes in this open network. We are registered as a 501c3 in the US, which means that we are a nonprofit with some um, tax deduction possibilities if you do donations and you are based in the US. If we start by taking a bit of a look at the history of Tor, if we go back to the early 2000s, uh, Tor back then was mostly Nick Mathewson and Roger Dinkeldine, who was working together with the U.S. Naval Research Laboratories on getting Tor to work and, and getting the first versions out. In 2004, the EFF sponsored Tor sort of um, with the ability to start taking donations and so on. In 2006, Tor incorporated and became a nonprofit. In 2008, the Tor browser development began. Before that, you would have to take a browser and um, make it use Tor using Privoxy or some other tool to uh, establish connection to a SOX proxy. This is something Georg is going to talk a bit about later when we talk about application development. In 2010, the Arab Spring happened, which was a time where a lot more people became aware of what Tor was and what Tor could provide for people. In 2013 was the summer of the Snowden revelations where we learned about the NSA mass surveillance. 
and Snowden also talked a bit about Tor back then. In 2018, a dedicated anti-censorship team was created in Tor to help with uh, developing new tools and new strategies for how to circumvent censorship in various parts of the world. In 2019, we shipped the Tor browser for Android. This was a pretty big uh, milestone. Tor has historically been mostly developing tools for uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows, and for, for desktop in general. But having a mobile browser was important because more and more people are starting to use their mobile devices as the primary devices. In 2020, we created the Network Health Team, which Georg is going to expand a bit upon later. The Network Health Team is responsible for monitoring the Tor network, sort of how well it's doing, and is there any issues with it? Is there something we need to quickly look into, and so on. In this photo, you can see some subset of the Tor community who is gathered at a developer meeting that we have usually twice a year when we're allowed to travel. We haven't had any this year because of the pandemic. We collaborate in Tor with a large amount of different organizations. Of course, we collaborate with Mozilla, who's developing the uh, Firefox browser, which is what Tor browser is based upon. But we also have some very good friends at the Guardian Project, which is working on um, mobile security tools for both Android and iOS. We work with Uni, which is responsible for doing a lot of monitoring of internet censorship all over the world. We have a project uh, that we collaborate with called the Library of Freedom Project, which is doing um, training of people to the point where they're able to train other people in digital safety, mostly with uh, librarians in the North America. One interesting part of developing anonymity tools that is slightly different from other software that we would develop is that we can't really measure how many users we have. We have some estimates from some different research papers that says that we have somewhere between two and eight million daily users. If you were doing software like normally where you are in an organization, you would add a lot of instrumentation into the software where you're able to measure how many users, what they do, which uh, views they're uh, focused on for how long time they're doing it. Same thing with social media today. People are looking at various indicators for how their performance are doing. Because we build anonymity systems, we can't really add these kind of metrics into our softwares. We can't really track and say we have exactly this amount of users. So we'll have to live with some kind of estimates from the different research communities that we collaborate with. The first thing we're going to do is to sort of build up a mental model of how the Tor network works. Before we do that, we're going to give an example on how, for example, a single relay system would work. This is incredibly similar to how a VPN provider works. It might be you have a VPN provider privately that you pay for, or it might be your company is providing a VPN system for you. In a VPN scenario, you will usually have a number of using a number of users using as a single relay in the system. This is the VPN server. What they will be doing is that they are usually encrypting the traffic to the VPN host, and then the VPN host decrypts the traffic and sends it out of the internet. This protects sort of the user's uh, transit of data between the user itself and to the VPN provider. One of the things here is that you rely very heavily on the intents of the provider. If the provider is, for example, malicious, or it might also be that they've made some administrative um, mess ups where they, for example, are storing locks and they're able to ship locks to other providers, even though they claim not to be doing it, this could be a problem. But it doesn't just have to be that the organization that is providing the VPN is malicious or have some other problems. It gives us one big problem, which is that it's a single point of failure. So you only have to attack a single node or a single set of nodes um, to gather information about a lot of users from this system. And additionally, because most users are sending their traffic over a single host, it would be pretty easy for an adversary to do timing analysis and bridge sort of the incoming traffic that is encrypted with the outgoing traffic, which might not be encrypted, and figure out which user is responsible for which outgoing connections of the system. If we instead take a look at how the Tor design is, in this case, we zoom in on Alice and Bob, which is the Alice is trying to make a connection to Bob. What we do now is that instead of having a single node, we add a whole network of nodes, which is what we call the anonymity network, or in this case, the Tor network. 
The idea is that we add several relays so that no single relay can betray neither Alice nor Bob. So the first thing Alice does here, which is an important thing to understand, is that Alice decides which path through the network that she wants to take. Alice has, through the directory system we have in Tor, an idea about every node that is available to her in the Tor network. From this, she has access to their encryption keys and thus knows what the keys are up front before she tries to connect to them. Alice decides the path, and the first thing Alice does here is that she establishes a secure session with the first relay, we call it R1. She then tells R1 to establish a connection to R2 and does so in an end-to-end -end encrypted manner where there's both authenticated and also encrypted traffic between it. Alice will then continue to ask R2 to extend what we call the circuit over to R3. And finally, she will tell R3 to connect to Bob. She now has an encrypted connection from herself to R1, via R1 an encrypted session to R2, and via R2 an encrypted session to R3, and now she can finally establish the TCP connection to Bob. If we take a bit of a look at how this works from the different adversary scenarios we can think of, Bob will be able to see that there's traffic coming from R3, how much traffic that's flowing, and so on. R3 will be able to see that there's traffic coming from R2. R2 will be able to see how much traffic there's coming from R1. And R1 will know um, that there is traffic coming from Alice and that it's connecting to R2. But what is important here is that we can see that only R3 knows about Bob. R2 and R1 does not know about Bob, which is the endpoint that Alice is trying to connect to. This means that the multiple hops on the system here, that they will have to cooperate to be able to betray Alice. And that should give us both some anonymity prop properties, but also some more security against various other observation techniques that can happen. It's important in this whole thing to understand that the anonymity properties doesn't just come from encryption. We have to have this multi-hop system to gain the anonymity properties. If we take an example where we have Alice and Bob having a direct connection, which is end-to-end -end encrypted over, for example, the TLS protocol. What happens here is that the encryption protects the content. Usually we combine encryption with authentication so that an adversary cannot actively go in and modify the traffic. But if we have an adversary that is eavesdropping on the traffic between Alice and Bob, like in this case, what they will see is basically gibberish. But one thing they will see that is important to understand is that they see that there is traffic flowing between Alice and Bob. And additionally, they get, they get information such as how, when did this session begin? When did this session end? How much data was transferred? How much data was received from both ends? Which um, TCP ports are they using to connect to and so on? This data is what we call metadata. And it's metadata that we try to protect in the Tor network so that you cannot collect metadata from the users that are part of it. And one of the reasons we do this is because of this guy. This is Michael Hayden. He's the former director of the NSA and the CIA. And he very openly in an interview a couple of years ago said that the US state kills people based on metadata. One part we won't be talking that much about in this presentation is our bridge system, but it still deserves a bit of a mention. Since some of the Tor users are in centered areas and because the Tor network is an open and public network, as I described earlier, when Alice is establishing the connection through the network, she knows every single node that is in the network. That means that it's trivial for an adversary who wants to block access to the Tor network to simply fetch a list of all the nodes in the network and then block all the IP addresses. And this is something we do see happen. What we have done then is that we've built an abstraction on top of this that we call the bridge system. In parallel to the Tor network, there is a more closed, it's a, a hidden network sort of to say, which is used to contain Tor relays that are used as entry points into the Tor network. But since these nodes are not listed in the directory documents, they are not as easy to censor. We then have various software to distribute it out to the users. This could be via email. It can be via uh, various web services that we have different system for accessing even in, in centered areas. If we um, 
if we take a look at how it works, one thing here is that we have Alice who's in a centered area. Alice is trying to connect to a bridge over the Tor protocol. One issue that could be here is that the attacker is able to identify at the edge between the centered area and to the bridge that Alice is communicating over the Tor protocol. This means that if you do DPI and so on, and you're able to say, given this connection, this is probably a Tor connection, then Alice was mo will most likely have her access to the bridge blocked, and eventually the bridge will be uh, blocked entirely for other users as well. To deal with this issue, we came up with a system called Plockable Transports. This is again a small abstraction where you can have your Tor client use a Plockable Transport client to connect to a Plockable Transport server, which is then connected to an actual Tor uh, daemon, which is giving access to the network. But using this PT system, you have you are able to use an obfuscated protocol instead of using just the Tor protocol itself. This have a number of pretty nice properties. It allows people to build an experiment and deploy these obfuscation technologies uh, without having to modify Tor itself. Tor is a uh, C code base. It's uh, pretty complicated. It uh, requires a bit of time for us to do code review and so on. So having a faster paced environment to build an experiment with this anti-censorship technology is pretty critical. And the pluggable transports um, helps with that. A cool thing about it is that it's an open system. We have a specification for it. We work with other vendors on it. And there are different VPN providers and so on that also support using uh, pluggable transport together with their systems. It's important for this pluggable transport system to have a diverse set of tools that works with it and that we can use in different scenarios. For example, it might be that one of them has a weakness, then it's important that we have other tools that works for different kind of people or in different scenarios. One of them that we haven't used right now is called the Obfuscator or Ops4. What it does is that it makes it more difficult for passive DPI to verify the presence of the Ops4 protocol as mentioned in one of the previous slides around bridges, it's possible for an adversary to see that a given connection is a Tor connection and thus shut it down. Another thing an adversary could do would be to try to connect to what it thinks is a Tor relay and try to speak a bit of the Tor protocol. If the uh, bridge responds with something that is the Tor protocol, it knows that this is a Tor connection. Ops4 protects against this by having a shared secret between the, uh, the client and the user that the adversary has to know as well. This makes active probing very difficult. It uses um, encryption, it uses the NTOR handshake from TOR, which is an X25519 based handshake, but it does some tricks to make the elliptic curve points indistinguishable from uniform random strings. Additionally, we have a system called Meek. Meek is using what is called domain fronting via HTTP. Domain fronting is very basically where the client makes a connection into one of the big public uh, cloud system. In this example, it uses Azure. What it does is that it seems to be connecting to a site that a sensor would have no interest in blocking, such as a big CDN site for some JavaScript code, for example. What it does is that a, an adversary monitoring Alice will see that Alice is doing a DNS lookup for Ajax, ASP.NET, CDN.com. And immediately after she receives the response, she's making a TLS connection into this cloud. And in the SNI header of the TLS connection, she requests Ajax, ASP.NET, CDN.com. But inside of the HTTP header, she will request a different host and many of these public clouds have different load balancers at the edge, and they will happily send you over to a, a different customer in the system where we are operating a, a bridge for, to access the Tor network. This is a very nice system. It's a bit expensive because we have to pay for all the traffic in and out of the clouds. And additionally, some of the cloud providers really don't like us uh, that we are, we are doing this kind of stuff. So to try to mitigate that a bit, we've built a system that uses less traffic. It's called Snowflake. The way Snowflake works is that we have a Snowflake broker, which is um, also in a public cloud, but is used for 
Alice. Alice connects to the Snowflake broker, also using um, this SNI trick and with domain fronting. But in this time, she doesn't have to send all her traffic via the public cloud. What she instead uses the broker for is to uh, find a WebRTC client out on the internet IP space that is uncensored. Alice is now able to make a WebRTC connection between herself in the censored area and this client, which is running in some person's web browser as a web extension out on the internet. And using this web browser as sort of a bouncing point, she's able to establish a connection to a Snowflake PT server over a WebSocket connection. This has the benefit that we're exchanging very little traffic over the cloud provider. And the game we are playing here is that um, we hope that the adversaries is not interested in blocking the entire IP space where people are usually having their laptops and their phones and thus where these Snowflake clients exist. We're finally at the point where we can start talking about the Torn network. As mentioned earlier, it's an open network. It means that every, everybody can join it. Um, the only thing you need access to is that you need a, a pretty stable internet connection. Um, ideally in some data center where you can run a, an operating system with the Tor software on. We have something between 6,000 and 7,000 nodes in the network. All of these nodes are provided by different individuals. Some are provided by companies who support the Tor cause or also different nonprofit organizations that set up, um, set up these organizations in their respective countries where they can get legal advice and so on. An important thing from the security of the Tor system is that we have a diverse set of these nodes called the directory authorities. We have nine directory authorities, and then we have a special directory authority, which is purely focused on the bridge system. The directory authorities' responsibility and uh, abilities is that they are able to decide which nodes um, are in the Tor network and which nodes are going to be kicked out. If, for example, we detect that they are um, doing something to the traffic, they're monitoring it, they're modifying traffic and so on. Georg is going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, these nodes are critical to the security of the system and they are run by trusted individuals that have been in the Tor community for a long time. They are hosted in different parts of the world. We have some in Europe, we even have one in Sweden, uh, we have some in the US and so on. The security of the majority of these nodes are pretty important to uphold and the safety of the system very much depends on these nodes being safe. If we take a bit of a look at the amount of bandwidth that exists in this network, we have two different things we have to look at. We have the advertised bandwidth and we have what is called the bandwidth history. The advertised bandwidth is the sum of how much bandwidth each relay think it has. And the bandwidth history is how much traffic that has been flowing through the, the network. If we take a look at, at the chart here, we can see that the traffic is generally growing. We have around somewhere between 500 and 600 gigabits of traffic available in the Tor network right now and we're utilizing somewhere between 200 and 300 gigabits. If you look at the top curve between 2019 and 2020, you would see there is a pretty steep uh, spike in there. This was some researchers who were doing an experiment to see how much traffic is actually available in the network, where they were trying to push some of the relays to their limits so that they were able to see how much traffic that are actually available in it. And we can see that we're slowly getting towards that step. If we look at the total number of relays and also the total number of bridges in the network, we can see that we have somewhere between 6,000 and 7,000, as mentioned earlier before. It's pretty stable right now. We're not getting that many more. Um, the amount of bridges also seems to be pretty stable. Um, and fortunately, it seems like they're growing in capacity in terms of network. But if you're interested in running a relay, we're of course always interested to getting more relays. It's important to understand that the safety of the Tor network comes from its diversity. One of the things is the diversity of the relays. The more relays we have, the more diverse they are, the fewer 
attackers in a position to do traffic confirmation. And diversity here means everything from which person is running it, which country they are, which AS number they are in, which operating system they are on, even down to which point release of the Tor release they are running. It's also important for the Tor network that we have diversity of the users and reasons and different reasons to use it. Georg is going to return to that later when he talks a bit about the applications of Tor. But one example here is that we have 50,000 users in, for example, Iran. It means that almost all of them are normal citizen and most likely not bots or anything like that. One uh, problem we do have is that we have an open research problem with is how do we measure this diversity in the network over time? One example of a place where we are not doing so well on diversity is the relay platforms. This is something we store in our metric system, so we have data about it historically. If we take a bit of a look at uh, the plot here, you will see that we have around 6,000 nodes, which is running on the Linux system. Historically, there has been a bit of a connection between the Debian project and Tor. So we believe that a large fraction of these Linux nodes are running either Debian or Ubuntu or some other Debian-based um, uh, distribution. One interesting thing we can say uh, about this plot additionally is that if we look around the change from 2015 to 16 is that the BSD relays are slowly taking over the number of Windows relays. We are generally not an organization that are very good with Windows on the server side of things. So that is definitely lacking behind also uh, some parts of it is, is our own fault. But it's really good to see that the BSD community is also picking up on uh, on Tor in general and are helping to provide uh, Tor relay hosting. Another place where the diversity could be better in the Tor network is the number of countries that we're in and how big the clusters are in the respective countries. If we take a look at this top 10 list of where which countries that have the most relays, we can see that uh, Germany have 1,500, the US have 1,100, France have almost 700 um, relays in their countries, which means that it's uh, it's very much centralized around some a very few number of, of countries. I thought it was a bit interesting to see Sweden was in the top 10 here. I think that's really awesome. Even though this is a virtual conference, I thought it would be fun to sort of highlight uh, Sweden together with Norway and Denmark in this case. Uh, where Sweden is doing uh, vastly better than Norway and, and much better than Denmark. I think, if I remember correctly, then Finland is number 11 on, on this list, if we, um, if we have that included. If we try to, um, to plot this on a world map, you can see how it looks here. It's very much centralized around the US and Central Europe. Um, this chart doesn't say that much because it's so centralized, but if we remove the top three, that is... Um, Germany and uh, the US and France, it will instead look like this. You can see that there are areas of the world where we generally don't have many relays running. We don't have nodes running in a large part of the African continent. There are parts of Latin America uh, where we are not running relays, Antarctica, of course, uh, Greenland as well. Um, we are, the relays are generally placed in areas where there is the least chance, of course, of them getting blocked. So it doesn't make sense, for example, to run a relay in Iran when there is already censorship going on in, in this country. If we, um, if we take a look at the networks there, and if you remember back at one of the earlier slides where I was talking about how Alice decides which path through the network that she's going to pick uh, amongst these three nodes, this algorithm for path selection has a number of settings that you can tune. For example, you're able to say, I want to have a path where I exit in Russia or where I exit in Germany. This can be useful if you're using the Tor network to, for example, test if a website works probably from Germany or from Russia or from some other place in the world. By default, one of the uh, properties that the default path selection have in Tor is that it refuses to add two nodes to the same path, which is within the same slash 16 network of uh, the IPv4 address space. So if we try to group the number of relays we have per slash 16 on the IP space, 
we can see that there is a number of them that have a very large number of relays as well, but it's still better than at the country level. We can, for example, see at uh, um, 185.220/16 that we have 216 relays in that network. If we move on and look at the AS number instead, we can see that OVH in France, which is a, a, a reasonably cheap um, a hosting provider where you can buy both physical and uh, VPS nodes, um, have around 770 nodes in the network. Hetzner, which is a, a big German, also pretty cheap provider, um, has 400 nodes in their network and so on. One thing that's interesting here is that some of the networks that exist operates in with different um, with different AS numbers. For example, I believe that uh, Linode and DigitalOcean, they are available in many zones also outside of Europe and outside of the US, so they have different AS numbers for these kind of things. Next up, Georg wants to talk a bit about how we in the Tor project handle malicious relays in the Tor network. As we've seen on the previous slides, having a low barrier for entering the Tor network is great for diversity. But on the other hand, it invites malicious actors as well to join the torrent work and mess with the user's traffic or even de-anonymize them. So what are we doing and what are we planning to do against those? I have um, put two scenarios on the slide which we are concerned with. So the scenario one is you have a malicious operator which is running a bunch of relays and trying to get them both in the guard and exit position and um, essentially de-anonymize users because they know where you are connecting from and, and then they they know where people are heading to and they can easily correlate th those things at least in theory and try and, and try to um, figure out what you are up to so that's that's bad news to prevent this we try to pin guard relays that means once you start your application towards picking a set of guard relays and uh, sticking to them for for a long time, like weeks and months, making sure that um, the risk is uh, the risk that you are actually picking a bad one and landing in this situation um, is pretty low. And on the other hand, we try to convince relay operators that they should set the so-called my family setting in their tool configuration file indicating that a set of relays is belonging to the same family, which in turn allows Tor to avoid those relays being in the same path when Tor is selecting the path through the network. But that's just one scenario we're concerned with. Um, a more likely scenario is that uh, a malicious actor is setting up exit relays and trying to um, snoop on user's traffic or manipulate even uh, user traffic, for instance, by rewriting Bitcoin addresses, trying to steal Bitcoin. So what are we doing against those? We have a set of tools um, which, is, which is scanning access relays, pretending to be legitimate, for instance, Tor browser users, and um, trying to attack attacks like uh, SSS trip attacks, where attackers would um, strip off the SSL protection and rewrite the, for instance, the Bitcoin address on an HTTP website and then try to steal the money. This is working, kind of. It, it's pretty hard to write good scanners because as soon as you um, just scan for website X being modified and the attacker is modifying instead website Y, um, your scanner is not detecting uh, this attack. So given there are some billion websites out there, it's pretty hard to scan uh, for this correctly and, and find all those mal malicious as stripping attacks. But if, uh, but once we find those, um, we swiftly blacklist um, those found relays and, and, their, and the families behind this, if there's a family behind this. But there's uh, overall an uphill battle. So we need uh, desperately need to change the arms race because we can't keep up with, with that one. What can we do instead? So there are at least two areas we can improve here. One is application level improvements. That means we configure, for instance, Tor browser in a way that it's only 
requesting HTTPS protected websites and is preventing downgrading to HTTP only or HTTP websites. Uh, there are two ways for this. Uh, once, uh, one way is to use built-in functionality of HTTPS Everywhere, an extension we already ship in Tor Browser, which can be configured to only allow HTTPS requests. And the other one is um, recently uh, Firefox got a feature called HTTPS only mode, um, which Mozilla is still testing and refining and we could backport uh, a bunch of patches and ship, the, ship those into a browser, which has the benefit that the usability is, is, is better than in the uh, HTTPS everywhere case. And this is an important point um, we must not forget because there are likely still a ton of HTTP only websites out there and um, there's a big risk that breakage for for users in, in this scenario um, leads them to using a different browser which is less secure and less safe then Tor browser is um, essentially making it worse for those users um, but apart from those application level improvements, there's um, the general idea of just limiting the influence of, of realists we don't know anything about when, uh, when Tor is picking a path through the network. What, what no here means is, is to be decided, but it could be a thing like a web of trust um, where some folks in the com community know those operators and can kind of watch for them and um, if, if we know them, they get just more of the traffic than uh, they would get otherwise. And we try to decide what good thresholds here are and where we should draw the line and, and make the uh, necessary changes and how, how they would look like. Um, overall, in particular, if there are different goals to consider, not just the bad relay uh, um, protection, but as well, our scalability and performance improvement plans. So there are some trade-offs to make. Um, we are currently in the process of um, of nailing down the plan and then think about prototyping uh, things to make um, this arms race change in a way that we can actually actually win it and not just um, be able to uh, uh, to act after the fact. As we are doing now. I think it's fair to say that most of our users come in contact with uh, Tor through one or the other applications um, in the first place. But how do we actually sell the different properties Tor provides to different user groups? If you are talking to private citizens, it's pretty easy to say, hey, you should use Tor because Tor provides um, privacy on the internet it helps safeguarding your privacy on the internet but that might not be as appealing to say human rights activists who might mainly be motivated to reach websites they care about like Facebook or news websites like The Guardian or BBC to inform themselves about things happening in their home country where they are censored if you're talking to businesses, on the other hand, then they might not really care about privacy on the internet or reachability, even, even though they should. But they are much more interested in uh, Tor helping them with their network security to keep their assets safe. If you're talking to governments, they are foremost interested in what is called traffic and access resistance, which given their opponents like nation states and the resources they have is quite a reasonable goal so having all those different user groups why do we actually care that all of them are port uh, are part of the tor network what is actually um, the goal behind that there are a bunch of reasons why we want to have a lot of diverse users on the tor network First one is that having a diverse user group is helping against singling out individual users. Um, you can think of it that way. If you already know that only government officials are using the Tor network, 
you already have narrowed down the potential user you are looking for considerably compared to uh, millions of users uh, with different backgrounds being in different countries uh, being online at different times and so on but there's a tension here right because all those different uses we want to have connect to the Tor network with their own devices um, and their own operating systems, which nowadays at least leak a ton of information, in particular if, um, if they are using a complicated tool like a browser. Um, how, do we, how do we prevent users from getting singled out that way um, so we have developed in the past and are still developing um, an own browser which is called Tor Browser which is helping against that problem so there are different strategies we could do here one of the stra strategies is um, which we actually do is trying to make users of Tor Browser as uniform as possible. That means um, why we still try to provide um, the best browsing experience as other browsers do as well, we go at great length and uh, trying to make users uniform. For instance, we try to avoid things like leaking your screen resolution or um, users being tracked across websites with tracking cookies or leaking your language you have pre-configured on your desktop or in your Tor browser and so on. So that's one way to deal with that problem, making users uniform. The other way is basically spoiling fingerprinting efforts by just um, returning random values or spoof values making it essentially an unusable means of singling individual users out but it's a problem which is not only a thing in the browser space but generally an application layer issue which one has to take uh, to, to care about but there's more I think we need as well a diverse set of users with diverse backgrounds to get our basic usability, privacy, and security properties right. If we optimize only for one user group uh, with one set of goals and one threat model, there's the high risk that we uh, endanger other users and other user groups because um, they might interact with the uh, applications like Tor Browser um, in a way that is not taken into account when we designing it. So they, they might make mistakes or just um, use it, use the application in a way which was not in our mindset and thus this is pretty dangerous. If we stick to Tor Browser for a while, what we've been doing in the past is doing trainings all over the world and you're still doing them to gather all those different use cases and goals and threat models out there and feed them directly into the Tor browser development back. This has resulted in a significant improvement in, uh, in usability and thus privacy protections and security guarantees. If you look at the screenshot I've put on the slide, for instance, as an example, you see in the upper right corner um, two icons. One is the shield icon, which is showing you easily the security level you are on. And if you click on it, it gives you access to choose a different one if you wish to do so. And the broom icon is meant to give you a new clean tour session if, if the need arises. And it's just one click away, while it's been previously buried in some sub-menus, which was clearly not optimal. And if you want to know something about your current tour usage, you can uh, easily click on the lock icon and uh, your current tour circuit is shown 
and there are ways to request new ones if the, if the need should arise. But there are clearly downsides to diversity as well, which we should talk about in this context too. So with users with diverse backgrounds and um, different behaviors entering the Tor network, you are eventually getting jerks on it as well. This is hardly surprising, right? But the consequences of that are pretty severe. So how does this look like? This looks like um, users getting blocked from reaching their destinations. For instance, if you're using Tor browser, you are not allowed to enter websites anymore, or you're getting captures you have to solve. And even that is not really helping sometimes. This is problematic um, because, I mean, if you are a normal user, a prospective user, or even a normal Tor user, and you're trying to enter um, the Swedish railroad company's website, looking up timetables or buying tickets, and you're getting created with the website I put on the slide saying, hey, you're not allowed because of your unauthorized behavior, then this is in the first place ridiculous and, and then highly confusing because, I mean, you, you just entered the uh, domain name and hit enter and that's it. There was no behavior like doing weird queries or messing with the website or, or something like that. So what you probably think is, oh, this tour thing is, is broken. It's not really usable. Let's do something else like firing up Chrome and moving on with our lives. Which is understandable, as I said. Um, but this is problematic um, for at least two reasons. The first one is it weakens the overall guarantees towards providing to all of its users because if you're jumping off the tour train and other users as well, then this weakens the cover for the remaining ones against getting singled out by adversaries. And secondly, it could even have consequences for you personally. Too, depending on your, uh, depending on where you're living and and the context you're living in, because if you are picking up a tool which is less sophisticated um, in safeguarding your privacy and security online, this could this could essentially endanger yourself. So we have to solve um, this problem somehow, and um, how we do this, we will examine on the next slide. So how do we solve this Tor blocking problem? Um, you may see all of those question marks already on the slide, right? So this should indicate that we don't have the silver bullet in sight, unfortunately. There are different tools we have in our toolbox. Both been using, uh, we have both been using them in the past, uh, in, the, in the present, and thinking about them for the future. Um, this might help, you see, it's not sure yet. So what I've been doing uh, traditionally has been reaching out to websites and trying to convince them that Tor users are all a positive thing to have, which was kind of a mixed success. Um, some website owners dropped Tor blocks. Um, some were not convinced. And even if they would have been, there's the risk that you would st start seeing blocks again like a week later when they changed their mind. Um, and you would start from uh, square zero again, which is overall a thing which is not scaling. In particular, if you look at the billions of websites out there and uh, the constant monitoring you would have to do and and then contacting all the website owners who are blocking tour. So this is really not a, a good solution, uh, if it's a solution at all. So we have to do something about the core problem that we have uh, jerks on the tour network, which is particularly hard in the tour context because Tor aims um, to provide anonymity for for essentially all of its users, not just for the non-jerk ones. And uh, apart from the problem that uh, there is no clear definition of what is a jerk and what not. So what can we do? We have been thinking about um, kind of proof of work schemes, solving small puzzles to um, to, to show that you spend some effort here and, uh, and this could allow you accessing onion services for instance or um, other things. Um, this has been mainly developed as a proposal 327 
in the context of solving the problem for denial of service against our onion services or against onion services. But it could happen in other parts as well. Then uh, uh, more sophisticated things could uh, include anonymous uh, credentials like privacy pass, where we would um, uh, issue tokens to users and, and, and those tokens can get um, exchanged uh, against access to services later on. Um, another thing we recently uh, thought about was allowing paid access relays where we would um, make sure that uh, those exits or the operators of those exits would make sure that uh, the IP reputation would stay high, um, which is usually um, the indicator of uh, getting blocked or not blocked, like low IP reputation would mean you're getting easier blocked by, by services than having a high IP reputation. So paid exit um, operators would uh, get get some kind of yeah, payment and in return would make sure that the those access relays would be ones with high reputation and those less likely to get blocked. Um, those are the things we are currently thinking about. As I said, we'll see how, how this goes uh, uh, in the long run, whether we deploy any of that at all or whether there are something, something better we come up with. It's, it's a tough problem we have to solve. We are slowly getting to the end of this presentation. We, are, we hope that you have gotten an idea about what Tor is, why the different diversity properties matter to the Tor system, where we can do better. If you're sitting at home and is thinking, how can I help uh, the Tor project in various ways? We have a number of things you can do. For example, you can, if you're a software person, you can start hacking on some of the cool projects we have. You can help us find and potentially even fix some of the bugs that we have in the software. The software we write is by no means perfect. If you run Tor on some interesting platform that might not be uh, what we used uh, normally, then helping testing Tor on, on these platform would be of great benefit to us. If you are more into research stuff, you can work on some of the different open research projects that exist. There is a pretty big community of uh, privacy researchers that are gathering together in some, I think there are annual, annual meetings called uh, PETS, where there is a lot of papers about uh, Tor presented. You can, if you have access to server hosting and bandwidth and a server, that um, you can run a Tor relay or a bridge and you can also go out and teach other people about Tor and privacy in general. Another important way that you can help is to donate to the Tor project. If you go to donate.torproject.org, we are running our end of the year campaign for 2020 right now. We are very happy to receive the donations. Donation money is excellent for us because the donation money that we get can be spent on things that we think is important. A lot of the development we do is grant-based where we write a proposal, then we go through a number of iteration of those, and then we get a final approval, and then we have a list of objectives that we have to go through and do the development for that. With donation money, we are able to look at things that are, for example, an emergency situation where we have a problem with the network that we would like to do something about, and the donation money allows us to spend developer hours on these things. So please check out donate.torproject.org. If you donate enough, you will be able to get a t-shirt or some other different kind of Tor branded swag. We're at the end of this presentation. We hope you have enjoyed it. We do have time for a couple of questions, we believe. So let's have a look at those. I will, yes. Awesome. So shifting over to the questions. Thank you for the talk. Um, I will actually take this chance to change the view here so that we can see both Georg and, and Alex. Uh, but yeah, take it away. Okay, so let's begin. There's plenty of questions, so I better stop talking. Does Tor, have, uh, does Tor, Tor work better the more people are using it, uh, kind of like uh, burying the important traffic in unimportant? Do you want to go with that one, Gary? Yeah, I can do actually. So, um, 
I think the answer is yes. So the idea behind Tor is, as, as we've seen in the talk, that we try to blend in as many different um, backgrounds and different users um, we have, so that it's harder for people to de anonymize users. And um, and yes, the scale is a is an important factor here. So if millions of users um, are using Tor instead of just hundred, then uh, um, the properties you get, the anonymity properties you get, are are much better, um, leaving all the other um, things unchanged. So I think that's that's it from my side at least. Yeah, that's good. You're muted, Henrik. Uh, this is not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only. Um, is the only way to use the network uh, this one browser, or are there more applications like Secure Chat uh, come to mind? Um, I, I can take this. Um, the primary product that we develop is the Tor browser. It uh, it uses the little Tor process to connect to the network, but we are starting to see other organizations or other individuals building different applications together with Tor. We have Michael Lee's uh, Onion Share, which is a I think it started out just being a file sharing tool that you could use uh, to share files easily in a, a secure way, also for people who are behind uh, NAT networks um, and, to, and in combination with the Tor browser. We also have people working on secure instant messaging. We have some people working on a new version of the Ricochet platform um, that we will hopefully see some more of in the future. Want to add something here, Georg? No, it's cool. cool. Okay, uh, this time, <laughs> um, uh, I seem to have very little knowledge about Tor, so here comes another question. I heard that there are .onion domains. How are those different? Should I start with this? Um, we, um, the way onion domains work is that you get this very long sort of random looking string and then .onion. What this long random string is, is that it's actually a public key. So it's a special kind of address. Instead of seeing it as a host name, you should think of it as an IP address, which is represented by a 256-bit public key. So you have authentication with who you are communicating with when you are making the connection. The Onion system doesn't rely on the exit nodes, that is the final nodes that is in the circuits that you create over the Tor network which means that these services stay within the network. So you can see it as they are anonymous services that doesn't use this pretty scarce resource that we have, which is the exit nodes. And you can then build application on top of that. The uh, Ricochet application that I just mentioned, and also Onion Share for that matter, uses this uh, these Onion domains for, for their file sharing uh, properties. Want to add something? No, it's fine. Cool. Should I combine the Tor browser with plugins like uBlock, Origin, Private Badger, uh, et cetera? I seem to remember having seen recommendations both for and against. I guess I picked that one up. Um, so what we are recommending is not to do so. So just take Tor browser as it is. The reason for that is um, that it's easily conceivable that Adding, um, adding different uh, extensions like uh, uBlock Origin or Privacy Badger is uh, measurable by uh, network observers. Like they change traffic. For instance, uBlock Origin is blocking a lot of stuff if it's working properly. So this looks differently if you visit a website than uh, um, using a normal Tor browser uh, as we ship it, as Tor Project ships it. So and this there's a risk that this um, makes you uh, like outstanding of of the group and makes you easier to identify. Um, on the other hand, I mean there are ideas um, improving uh, uh, Tor browsers' performance by shipping an ad blocker or a blocker like uBlock Origin, because um, that way a lot of crap is not loaded in Tor browser anymore, meaning um, sites load faster and this kind of stuff. 
So there are definitely ideas using this kind of um, um, ad blocker or even the, the Firefox built-in uh, um, tracking protection mechanism for improving the overall performance. But right now it's not really recommended um, to add those extra extensions. <laughs> Okay, uh, can using Tor make you become a law enforcement target? Example, law enforcement agency might think that user X has something to hide. Hmm. I, I can start with this one. Um, so this comes down to a little bit the thing we were talking about that we need diversity in the network, that we need to have users using it, not just when they need to be anonymous, but also use it for their everyday tasks such as uh, social media, reading news, uh, doing all these kind of things. Um, of course, if um, let's say you are trying to do something unlawful or something like that in the in your country and you're the only tour user there and you write uh, to your local pizza place that he's an idiot or something like that, um, then it will be pretty clear that uh, you're the only one using tour in that area, right? So you will stand out. But this is where it's so important that we get more and more people to use it for the everyday tasks to avoid that kind of scenario. Yeah, I mean, just to add uh, two sentences to this one, um, Tor is not trying to hide that you're using Tor, right? I mean, there is, um, it's not, the, the idea is not to make it hard that you're um, trying to hide that you're using Tor. So yes, I mean, you're kind of outstanding uh, in, in a way that uh, folks can easily see, hey, this one is, this, this fellow is using Tor. Um, and that's every, uh, always to keep in mind. Um, but on the other hand, as Alex said, um, it's important to get um, diverse set of users that this is not really a problem anymore. And, and uh, I think if you look around, most of the time, it's not really a problem. I mean, you have probably heard stories in the news that um, that folks got really um, like um, tracked down because of their tour usage, but then they were just only like one tour user in a, in a certain setting, and it was pretty easy to see. Hey, this this crime got committed over tour, and there was just one tour user at that time um, here. So that's probably it. So yeah, there were a set of users and many users, and this shouldn't actually be a problem. Uh, could outreach um, to avoid blocking be made more feasible uh, by communicating with uh, cloud CDM providers? You mentioned some of them don't like Tor. Why not? Uh, I think it was in my slide that I said that um, that they don't like Tor. That was uh, specifically around this domain fronting trick we do. Um, I think a lot of the companies that provide web application firewalls, um, such as what Cloudflare provides and also many of the CDN providers have a have settings to disable Tor users, which we think is unfortunate because um, we believe that not uh, there is not that much abuse that should be coming out of it and you end up blocking for real users who are just using it to, to use sites. We also think the blocking of Tor people by default, Tor users by default, is a bit of an unfortunate thing and it's, um, they should be able to technically build better solutions. For example, if you on a web block, let's say it gets a lot of abuse from Tor users, one natural thing there could be to say, then we just block all Tor users. Um, but then you lift out also the users who are not doing any kind of abuse. So instead, one thing you could be doing is that you could have that every user should be able to read your site, but it might be they have to solve a capture or do something else when they want to comment on it or register with an email address that works and so on. There are various ways where you can sort of tune these parameters for, for how much safety it is. And we think, of course, it's unfortunate that you end up disabling by default. Um, to add to that, um, we are actually talking to, uh, to CDNs. For instance, we are in close contact with Cloud, Cloudflare um, because Cloudflare is um, seeing so much of the internet traffic and uh, what what happened in the past was that you got a lot of captures because suddenly all all folks got subscribed to Cloudflare and there's an option um, enable Tor and it's uh, it's an option to um, um, yeah to, to make sure that you're not attacked by folks coming from the Tor network and 
And of course, I mean, if you are um, subscribing to Cloudflare and you want to get the full benefit of uh, securing against as many threats as possible, you are checking the Tor checkbox, right? So what happened was a lot of our users were seeing captures and and it did cost us thousands of users because um, normal users are not um, seeing so frequent captures as they were seeing with Tor browser. And they were basically say, uh, saying, hey, your Tor browser is broken. It, I, I got hacked. What, what's this crap? And they, and they were choosing something else. So we saw this in, in the downloads and the users, user statistics. And we got in contact with Cloudflare. And um, they, they, uh, while they didn't really fix their setup, um, let, me, let me put it that way, they worked around it in a way that they're treating Tor browser users especially. And now... Um, you're almost seeing no uh, no captures anymore, but there's obviously there are more um, CDM providers like Akamai and so on. Um, yes, talking to them is definitely a thing we should do and we are doing, but it's often uh, often it's the case that we are not important enough. We don't have the right contacts um, to to make really um, a big change here. Cloudflare being the exception. What Tor alternatives are, uh, are there, and how do they differ from Tor? Oh, there is. Um, I, I personally don't know very much about the alternatives. I know there is I2P. Uh, one of the things, as far as I understand, Tor is stream oriented. We work with data streams. Right now, we only work with TCP. We hope to be able to do UDP in some kind of the same way that uh, NAT router sees UDP packets as sort of a, a kind of stream as soon as there is a, a response to it. We hope to have that in the future. Um, I2P is more packet oriented as far as I understand. And they have a big focus. They have a lot of users on, uh, I think, doing uh, also file sharing and generally staying more inside the network. There's also been with the uh, rise of cryptocurrencies, there's been a lot of focus on uh, mixed networks, which was sort of uh, what was there before Tor happened. Um, and that has gotten an intention again now for uh, doing anonymous transactions, but they are more high latency, um, whereas Tor tries to be fairly low latency. Yeah, I think we should uh, be fair and mention like um, uh, at, at least privacy focused VPNs as well. Yeah. The that they uh, try to provide um, censorship circumvention or, or even privacy protections by saying, hey, we don't lock your traffic. Um, and we don't collaborate with uh, law enforcement agencies or our secret services. Um, but as we've, we've seen on the slide, I mean, they are basically a single point of failure, right? I mean, you could just easily snoop in front of the VPN um, server and uh, behind it, and then you can correlate the traffic at least or outright compromise um, the VPN server. And then um, your your privacy your anonymity is gone, which is why you have the, the multi-hop system. Uh, that toys, but but still, I mean, there are there are good guys in the VPN business. It's not that that all of, of those are trying to make um, uh, cheap cheap buck uh, out of your traffic, or even try to to correlate your traffic and sell it to a third parties. Um, so, but still, I mean, those are single point of failures, and and we and we think that's that's a thing we don't want, and we can we can do better here. Okay, about fingerprinting, uh, what is the benefit of randomizing spoofing uh, versus sending um, some data for all users? Hmm. I'm not sure, sure I get the question here. Um, um, that's probably related to my, to my slide that there are different techniques trying to, uh, to combat fingerprinting. Um, there are there are ways um, where you can send um, basically fake data to uh, uh, to fingerprinting fingerprinting scripts, and and we kind of do this. Firefox um, recently implemented a thing where you um, where you send a kind of a poison pill to a, um, to fingerprinters, uh, making their uh, fingerprinting technique essentially useless. At least that's the goal. Um, so we we try to make users as uniform as possible as the the first to go way because that's usually easier. It's costing less resources, 
uh, and there's no risk that the uh, um, that the fingerprinter is trying to uh, um, reverse your spoofing and or your fear of your sending fake data because maybe your algorithm is not good enough and they can just revert it and get the actual actual data or, or this kind of stuff. So I think we are on the safe side if we try to make use as uniform as possible. And often if you if you try to send fake data, there's the risk that it's getting computation intensive, uh, especially in, in, in critical path. Um, uh, in the critical path uh, where, where latency is, is mattering, like rendering a web page or so, if uh, if your if your algorithm has suddenly to compute a ton of stuff just to to emit the uh, the fake data, then uh, it might be visible um, on the website. Um, but but still, there are research papers uh, which try to to show that it's at least feasible to think about um, sending fake data for particular. Um, fingerprinting vectors um, so that's a concept which which needs to be explored um, but but still at the moment we think um, for most of the fingerprinting vectors it's better to try to um, not spoof the day um, uh, the fingerprinting parts and make users uniform put them in different buckets and make sure that um, those buckets have enough users so that um, single ones can't get singled out a thing we recently added in uh, one of the Tor releases, not in the browser, is uh, a protection mechanism called WTF. It stands for Web Traffic Fingerprinting Resistance. Um, it's um, one of our developers called Mike, who's been working on this for a long time, also with some researchers in Belgium, I believe. The idea here is that you have an adversary that observes in, an encrypted data stream and tries to be able, using machine learning, to figure out what sites is this person trying to visit. It has become very relevant in both uh, the world we have today where a lot of websites is using TLS, but we also see TLS being rolled out for uh, DNS and so on. And in the sort of in the IETF protocol world, there is a very big focus on performance that makes a lot of sense both in terms of CPU, but also how much bandwidth we use to transfer data. And adding padding to everything or trying to add uh, fingerprinting resistance into the protocols by default might not be something an organization like IETF wants to do because they're focused on performance and bandwidth and so on. But in Tor, we have built uh, what I think is a pretty cool system where uh, you basically, the connection you make to the middle node has a little state machine in it that can make your traffic look like a some kind of distribution so that uh, we can change dynamically in the network to make the curve look differently. And then if uh, both the client and the middle node tries to honor these things, uh, the traffic that the guard is observing will be different from what the traffic um, the exit node is seeing because we uh, terminate this uh, this additional padding at the, at the middle node. So this is something that's getting a lot of research right now and we're trying to uh, keep up with that. So we actually have a last question here. So uh, is the only way to install the Tor browser on Ubuntu by to download it from the website as a zip? Um, is there an apt or dev package then? Um, so there's the there's only one rec recommended way, and that's downloading it from our website um, by. Uh, by downloading the uh, the tarball, the, um, the compressed tarball, and then checking hopefully the signature at least. Um, we don't have Tor browser in any of the regular Linux um, package repositories, mainly um, due to lack uh, of folks driving this idea forward. We have been talking in the past getting it into Debian, but then it's not so easy because uh, there's already Firefox in it. And what do we do with the Tor browser, which is essentially a Firefox plus a couple of patches. So there are some policy issues uh, to, to route around. And then once we would have it, once we have it in Debian, it would be uh, probably easy to get it in Ubuntu as well. Um, we agree that would be the, the ideal way to solve this problem on Linux, at least um, the packaging problem. But right now that's not, the case and it's not 
the case that anybody from the tour project is spending some time on this in the near or middle future. So if, if somebody wants this and is able to help, please step up. We would be glad to, uh, to help them help us. Cool. So thank you very much for the answers. Um, the, there are some thank yous in the comments as well. So it's yeah. not only me. Uh, I'd also <laughs> like to don't. thank everyone who, who participated during the days. Uh, speakers, listeners, uh, Henrik and Thompson and, and Gina who helped out with the, the behind the scenes stuff and asking questions and so on. Um, we will be around. We are still trying to plan a physical event during next year. We will see when it happens. Um, but if nothing else, we will run a virtual event this spring if we cannot meet in person. So thank you very much for everyone who uh, listened and joined us. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.